Welcome to St. Paul's Lutheran Church. It's good to be here with you here in God's house where we can take these moments together on God's word and grow in our faith as the Holy Spirit works through that word and praising our Father in heaven together as well. My name is Nick Schmaller. I'm a pastor, now a professor at Martin Luther College in Newell, Minnesota, where I teach Greek and theology. It's my privilege to lead you in worship here this evening. We are focusing on our theme for today as the last day. And we're in a season that is often called end times, where we focus on what will happen at the end of this age, that Jesus is going to come again on a final day as a righteous judge. And we are going to think about the signs that point to the fact that Jesus is coming again, what he tells us about it, and then our attitude towards it as well. That although Jesus is coming as a judge, the way that he looks at you, those that are found in faith in him, is one of grace and mercy. And it will be a great and glorious day where he takes us to our final home. So that will be the focus of our worship here this evening. Let's begin our worship by joining in our opening hymn, which is a picture of that final home, Jerusalem the Gold. <laughs> Please sing. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature, and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should have. I deserve your punishment, both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, so rule and govern our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may always look forward to the end of this present evil age and the day of your righteous judgment. Keep us steadfast in true and living faith, and present us at last holy and blameless before you. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first lesson for this evening is from the last prophet of the Old Testament, Malachi, verses from chapter 4. Here in these verses, Malachi is foretelling the last day, and it's called the Son of Righteousness that will come. That's S-U-N instead of the S-O-N, pointing to the Son of God, Jesus. And as he describes the Son of Righteousness, it kind of has two purposes. One is that scorching heat of the sun, that on the last day there will be judgment, but also the warmth and light that the sun brings, which is to the case for when Jesus comes again, that he will take his people and give them true life, life eternal. Let's read the words of the prophet Malachi as he points to this last day. Surely the day is coming, it will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble, and the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them, but for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. And you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Then you will trample on the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, well, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Second lesson for today is from Paul's letter, his second letter to the Thessalonians, verses from chapter 1. This will also serve as a basis for the sermon this evening. All this is evidence that God's judgment is right, and as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you have believed our testimony to you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand then for the reading of the gospel from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 20. tells the apostles the signs of the end times that we still see today and that helps to keep our mind focused on the fact that Jesus will come again and to be prepared and ready for when he does come. We read. Some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, as for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen? 
And what will be the sign that they are about to take place? He replied, Watch out that you are not deceived. For many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and uprisings, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilences in various places, and fearful events and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison, and you will be brought before kings and governors, and all on account of my name. And so you will bear testimony to me. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves, for I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but not a hair of your head will perish. Stand firm, and you will win life. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated for the singing of our next song.
Grace and mercy and peace, they are yours through God our Father and our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The basis for the message this evening is that second lesson from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, which you've already heard read. Let's begin with a short prayer. O Lord, you are the one who delivers us from evil, and for that we always thank and praise you. There are many enemies of your church and of your people that try to do us harm, so rouse yourself to punish them. Consume them in wrath, break the teeth in their mouths, let them vanish like water that flows away, make them like tumbleweed that the wind blows away. Cover your enemies with shame so that people will seek your name. How did you feel about that prayer? Maybe it was a little shocking to hear such strong words about the enemies of God in a prayer like that. And yet, those words, those phrases are taken directly from the Psalms. That there are many times throughout the Old Testament where God speaks in that very way about the enemies of God. That there will be destruction and doom for those that oppose his will. In fact, Jesus, and here in the lesson that we are focusing on today, the Apostle Paul does the very same thing, that he talks about the judgment that is going to come for those that oppose God's will. In very strong language. Martin Luther, he once wrote, I cannot pray without cursing at the same time. And there he's talking about the true sense of the word to curse, to wish God's judgment on someone. And of course, that is absolutely true. That any time that we say the words, your kingdom come, not only are we praying that God's gospel would advance here in this world, but that also all those that would oppose the gospel, that would lead somewhere else besides the narrow door of saying that only through Jesus do we have access to the Father, anyone else, that their plans would be thwarted. And so when Paul writes in those, let, in those words to the Thessalonians, he says, He will punish those who do, not, who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Paul is modeling a type of prayer that God has recorded in the Old Testament and the New Testament as well. And so he's modeling it for us to pray too. So now the question is, when do we pray that type of prayer? Well, we have other examples of Paul praying this type of prayer as well. In 1 Timothy, he mentions two people, Hymenaeus and Alexander, who he says have shipwrecked their faith. And then Paul is praying a prayer that God would hand them over to Satan so that they would be taught not to blaspheme. And maybe through that judgment, who knows, may be saved. So what sort of prayer should we pray when we hear about Christians all over the world that are being beheaded or imprisoned just for the sake of Christ? What should our prayer be in those situations? What should our prayer be when your church posts something on Facebook and somebody just goes into the comments, not because they are interested in it at all, but just to add their own blasphemy and to hinder the work of the Lord in a congregation? What should our prayer be then? Not too many months ago, I was listening to a, a Greek historical lecture from a professor in a prestigious university, and as he's talking about Greek history, he, he pauses and goes off topic, and he says, you know what, I shudder to think about how many of you have actually read the Christian scriptures. And I shudder even more to think that some of you might believe it. How do we, how do we pray in situations like that, too? You know, if we model ourselves and our prayers after Scripture, that we would pray in those situations that God would enact his justice, that God's kingdom would come, and that we put things in God's hands and let the righteous judge do what he will. You know, there are examples of this very thing taking place really all throughout Scripture. You know, one of the most memorable and even kind of shocking stories is the story of Elisha as he is outside the town of Bethel. Elisha, of course, was a very prominent prophet of the Lord, one who was able to do many miraculous signs. And really, although miracles are throughout the pages of Scripture, they really were fairly rare as far as periods of history where they occurred. 
that Moses, Aaron, and, and Joshua, they were able to do miracles as they rescued the people of Israel from Egypt. And, and then Elijah and Elisha, that they did miracles quite a bit. And really, although there were miracles other times, it almost is only up until Jesus' day and his apostles where miracles became so prevalent again. And Elisha was doing so many miracles and was so well known that even foreign commanders were told about the power of this prophet. And Naaman had come and was healed from his leprosy. And maybe if you recall the story of Elisha outside of Bethel, maybe our initial reaction is, you know what, kids will be kids, it seems pretty harsh. But no, this was blasphemy against God's own prophet, knowing what he could accomplish. The story goes that Elisha is walking outside this town of Bethel, and some, um, some children, 42 plus, they come out just to mock him. Go on up, you bald head. He, they shout at him. And Elisha, he prays that same prayer that Paul does. He calls down a curse from God. And out of the woods come bears that maul and kill 42 of those children because they had mocked the prophet of the Lord. So we see these examples all throughout scripture of types of prayers like this and of God acting in judgment in the Old Testament and New Testament as well. And so when Paul is writing to these Thessalonians, of course, his words of judgment are not unexpected, yet they are, of course, unwelcomed. Because the Thessalonians had been persecuted quite a bit in just a short amount of time that Paul probably is writing these letters not too much longer after his first visit. And in fact, we're told in the book of Acts that Paul actually probably had a very short visit in Thessalonica. That he was there for three consecutive Sabbaths for maybe three weeks, maybe even only two until the Jews had roused up such trouble that they had locked up or taken into prisoner uh, one of his friends named Jason. And, and then finally, Paul was, had to leave the town not only for his own safety, but for the safety of all the friends, all of his Christian friends that had come to faith in just those few weeks. And if that wasn't bad enough, Paul goes down then next to this town of Berea, where we think about those that eagerly search the scriptures, and, and the same people go there to stir up trouble and kick Paul out of that town too. Such hatred for the message of Jesus. And so Paul in his letters, he looks to comfort them, to encourage them. And how does he do that? Well, one, he tells them to pray this prayer. And he also encourages them about what God will do. And maybe better, not just what God will do, but who God is. Who is God? He is one that sees all things. And so even when the Thessalonians were under this persecution and deprived of their spiritual father of Paul, he's reminding them that God does see their trouble. It does not go unnoticed. Who else is God? God is just. That when something wrong is done, as a holy God and a just God, there must be punishment, recompense for something that is done that is wrong. And yet Paul does go on more. He says, who is God? And he points you to God's marvelous love. Because if the last element that Paul would emphasize is the justice of God, man, what a terrifying thing that would be. Because we know that if we were to stand before a righteous, just ju judge, all on our own, well then the sun of righteousness would burn us up too. Because there are many times that we have failed to live up to the standards that God demands. Just like those that had persecuted the Thessalonians. That we find our own way better. And even if we don't threaten imprisonment or punishment on those that are Christians, we can still put the voice of Christ to the side when we follow our own desires instead of following his voice and his word. And so when we see the righteous judge Christ coming and his rightful place as the judge, we're reminded that he allowed himself to be judged first. That he was called a curse, put all of the sin's burden upon his shoulders. So that when the righteous judge comes, he does not see our sin and our failings. Instead, he sees the perfect righteousness of Christ. What a beautiful 
exchange. And all throughout scriptures, as he thinks about and paints, about, paints the pictures of this judgment that is coming on the last day, while he does have this just attitude towards sin, he reminds us every time, think about those words of Malachi, that those who are found in the Lord, that it will be a day of rejoicing, covered in Christ's righteousness. You know, every time we get to this time of year, I, I think about a conversation that I had with, with good family friends when I was a pastor back in Indiana. And we were talking with them, they had children the same age that we did, and we were talking about raising children in the sinful world, and, and how do you have difficult conversations with them, even at an early age. And, and at the end of the conversation, finally I said, you know what, all this just reminds me that Jesus is coming again soon. And it wasn't until months later, even though we saw them almost every other week, months later that the wife, the mother, had told me that she couldn't sleep for weeks because of that time. Because I said, it reminds me that Jesus is coming soon. Because she only thought about the righteous judge that was coming. To think about, was she ready? Could she stand before someone so perfect and holy? Not so with you. Because of what Jesus has accomplished. It will be a day of rejoicing. To see your Savior with your very own eyes. To behold his face and to see every knee bow before the one who truly deserves it. For what he has accomplished for your salvation. What a marvelous thing it will be. And yeah, I want to go once more, back once more to that prayer. Because I still sometimes have a, a difficulty with the, the prayers that are recorded like that in Scripture. You know, we are taught it is a prayer that we should pray. We should model the words of Scripture. And we're told about situations where this very thing was prayed and it is blessed by God. But can I, can I make a confession to you that... When I see those Facebook posts speaking blasphemy of things under a, a church's name, it's not, I don't pray the prayer because I'm offended for God, but I feel like they're attacking me, right? When I heard that lecture of that prestigious professor, I didn't pray that prayer so much because he was taking the Lord's name in vain and criticizing God's very own word, one of the greatest treasures we have, but no, it's because he was calling me for believing. You know, it's kind of like everything. That God does give us, you know, righteous ways to use his word to pray these prayers. But because of my sinful nature, you know, I just can't seem to do it many times the way that God asks. It's no wonder the Apostle Paul, well, he does it perfectly through inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But in the church, as we pray these prayers, sometimes we pray the prayer expecting the answer, the outcome, in the way that we would determine instead of giving it to God and letting him decide. Let me, let me give you one example. If there ever was a time when the Christian church could pray specifically about one person and ask for God's destruction on that person because of the way that they were persecuting the Christian church, wouldn't it be the Apostle Paul? Or, or better, I call him Saul at that time. Because in Acts, we are told that Saul had one purpose. He was trying to destroy the Christian church. And so how many prayers did the Christians pray at that time? Praying that God would defeat his enemy who was killing and imprisoning Christians all over the known world. And truth be told, God did answer them. But it wasn't with bears. It was with a bright light. That as Paul was walking on the road to Damascus, Jesus appeared to him. And with a voice said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And said, follow me. Be a missionary. You see, when it comes to the judgment of God, Isaiah chapter 28, it calls it God's strange and alien work. Because God's foremost will towards all people is that they would be saved. In Ezekiel, it says, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Isn't God's way with dealing with Saul so much better than maybe what those Christians have prayed that day? Isn't his way dealing with you so much better than anything else we could possibly imagine? 
And that's because of the prevailing attitude of God. He's out of grace and mercy. God can't change who he is. He sees all things. He sees our needs. He sees our sins too. God is just. Where there is sin, there must be punishment. But God is love. And that's what led God to live in this world. That's what led Jesus to take our place. So that he would not experience that righteous judgment that we truly would have deserved. But instead he bore it on his own shoulders. Because God cannot change. And yet he wants you to be with him forever. And so on the last day, the reason will be glorious is because we're going to marvel at just how wonderful God's plan of salvation is. You know, Paul, he puts it this way. He says, on the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people, he will be marveled at among those who have believed. And this includes you. Because you. This is why we look forward to that last day. Because God's ways are so mysterious and so marvelous. Then in his grace, instead of punishing us, he's chosen us. He punished his son instead. So that you could be called his son, his daughter. Give glory to God. And we pray all prayers in his name, leaving all things in his hands. Knowing who God is. Please stand. Now may this peace of God which transcends all understanding, may it guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. <coughs> Let's join in confessing our Christian faith according to the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father and the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came God from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated for prayer. We pray the response of prayer. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. I your word in our hearts and cause it to produce truth in our lives. Strengthen and defend your church, that by your word and sacraments, faith may grow and love toward all may increase. Support all who spread the light and the truth throughout the world. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Praise the Christians to serve you in the ministry of the word and in all godly walks of life. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Give them wisdom that they may promote justice and hinder evil. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Be with all who devote themselves to any useful task. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Especially we commend to your care today Steve Oaks as he is about to undergo surgery this coming week. 
We thank you for blessing doctors and medical workers with great skill. Please bless their work so that your servant may enjoy relief and recovery from his affliction. With confidence in your faithful love, we place him in your hands. And we also remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Grant them your love and take them into your tender care. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you who now rest from their labors. Console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Keep us in the true faith and bring us at last to the joys of heaven. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again. Amen. We'll now gather our offering to the Lord. If you haven't had a chance to fill out the connection card yet or, or scan the QR code to do that, please take the time to do so and you can place it in the offering baskets either as they pass by or as you leave the worship service. Please stand. good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock until he comes again in glory. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
give thanks to you, O God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things. In him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate word, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in you. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your Spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we glorify and honor you, our God and, O oh God, our Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you all.
Now may this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and keep you in the Christian faith until life everlasting. You may depart in peace for your sins are forgiven. Amen. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And his mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We'll join in singing our closing. <laughs> to read. It's a call acknowledgement letter from uh, uh, Stephanie Nocella uh, from Tomahawk, Wisconsin. So I'll just read that here for us. Dear members of St. Paul's, I am truly blessed to have received the call to be a teacher at Jesus Loves Me Learning Center. Proverbs 22 states, train up a child in the way he should go and when he is old, he will not depart from it. This passage is especially important when thinking about the lives that are reached in early childhood ministry. I want to thank you for the opportunity to look at the two calls that God has given me to decide where best to serve him. Please keep me and my family in your prayers. I have full confidence that the Lord will bless my deliberations, and no matter what the decision, it will be to his glory. In Christ, 70 years old. I was told perhaps it was one other announcement by someone by, uh, yeah, is it you? Okay, yep. great. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> Hi guys, uh, so my name is Jesse Becker and I'm part of the outreach board and I help with the events. And one of the events that we do every year is the Bells on Belgrade event. For those that don't know, Bells on Belgrade is kind of a fun event for families. Uh, it's a bunch of businesses that get together and we at St. Paul's as a church get invited to kind of do the live nativity. And as that live nativity, we kind of help tell the story of Christmas. So it's a great way, great outreach event for us and it helps bring the story of Jesus and tell the story of Jesus and his birth um, at a public event. So um, there's a sign-up sheet back there if you're interested or if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Thanks. God's blessings then to all of you on this coming week.